Hello, I'm V.V. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today uh, in, the, in the Mercury Library with Patrick Davis, Executive Director of Progress Now New Mexico. As its website says, it's a nonprofit, nonpartisan, grassroots communications and advocacy organization working to unite, empower, and enhance the progressive voice in the land of enchantment. I've asked Patrick here today to discuss the anti-abortion issue on uh, the city ballot on November 19th uh, and to talk uh, with us a little bit about the nature of local politics and its resurgence in New Mexico and been around the country, but particularly here in Santa Fe of late. I consider him to be one of the strongest, most principled political thinkers in New Mexico today. He holds a master's in criminal justice from New Mexico State University, uh, has served as a, a police officer on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Uh, he ran for sheriff here and came close. A work of his on the use of emerging digital and social media as community and media engagement tools was published by the FBI National Academy in 2009. It's really great to have you here with us today, Patrick. Thank you, it's great to be here, uh, and thanks for the introduction. So it's a mouthful and a lot, uh, always great to hear. So y'all have had a lot of great guests, and I, I'm honored that you're having us over here. So a lot of things happening right now in local politics all across New Mexico, and a lot we can talk about. Well, there must be a heck of a lot to talk about, but let's talk first about this, um, this anti-abortion measure. Um, why do you think um, uh, the groups involved have chosen Albuquerque? Uh, as the first place in, in the country to try and, and, and lay this on a population? Well, in, in some respects, I think we're the victim sort of of our own success. Uh, yeah, a couple of, of factors are converging right now, sort of in national politics and then here on the local level, in that if you look at in the, the last few years, and Rachel Maddow viewers know this very well, uh, that the sort of the right wing has been uh, eroding away at Roe v. Wade and, and women's health issues for a number of years at a state legislature level in North Carolina and Texas and North Dakota. But they've about run out of hard red state legislatures that will advance these these agenda items. And so if you're in that movement and looking for what do we do next, you've got to find a new horizon. And how do you make progress in a state like New Mexico, for example, where uh, a Democratic legislature has consistently stopped their sort of extreme, uh, unconnected agenda? And so they can do that here in Albuquerque because uh, they followed and saw the example of organizers on the ground here using our city charter amendment process to advance changes like the minimum wage, like the charter change that requires a 50% uh, victory in elections instead of a minority election. And so they saw sort of those things happening and realized the opportunity for them. And, and that's sort of the organizers for this said that they saw the minimum wage happen here in Albuquerque. They saw from their perspective how easy it was. And let me tell you, I worked with a lot of those folks and it wasn't easy at all. But from their perspective, it was an organizing opportunity. And, and so when those national groups said, where do we go next? These state groups are going to these conferences saying, we saw the other side do this thing. Can we do that on our issue too? And so in some sense, we made the citizen democracy process at the local level in Albuquerque so easy and so engaging um, that it invited this to Albuquerque as sort of the, t the Petri dish, as Salon said today, uh, for this new, uh, how do we do this on the right? That's a great answer. So the, the, uh, so so our successes in the right direction have led to a terrible burdensome thing in the wrong direction in my judgment so so suddenly we have um uh we've become a kind of national battleground really haven't we and uh, who's who's on who's behind this move i mean this is a in my judgment a terrible idea a, a 20 week ban on abortions you know where i mean usually um these kinds of things are are the most dire cases they're hardly ever done voluntarily there it's always about some awful awful condition inside the mother and and uh I mean, this is a real war war on woman issue in my judgment but so who's who's behind this thing it is bad and and it is this is it's very little about 20 weeks and the pseudoscience that's sort of behind that this is about eroding away at women's opportunities we see this in national elections we see this in national campaigns and in these state legislative battles 
Uh, but this is what what this really is is it's inserting the government in a place where women, their families, uh, their doctors, and some for some women their own faiths have been making these decisions responsibly for decades, um, and they're trying to insert the government into that place because uh, they they don't believe in some cases that those women have. Uh, the common sense, I assume, uh, and the personal responsibility to do that. And we know that's just not the case. Yeah. The groups that are behind this are the same ones we're seeing push this other agenda. Don't be fooled. This looks very grassroots from the beginning. Uh, the shaver, the, the Bud and Tara shaver who, who started sort of some of this work here in Albuquerque a few years ago, uh, relocated here from Kansas following the murder of Dr. Tiller. Uh, when the doctors from that clinic relocated here to Albuquerque to continue their practice. The the groups that on the ground there, like Operation Rescue, relocated Bud and Tara Shaver here to begin to work against them here in Albuquerque. So it, it is very much a national movement. And we see that in we're, the work that we do at Progress Now, sort of tracking how these agendas and how these, uh, these movements grow over time. We saw, for instance, we saw this coming, although we didn't know where this was going to lead. We saw a new resurgence of this uh, about a year and some change ago when Bud and Tara Shaver opened their own clinic and began to do records requests to the cities for 911 calls um, from clinics that provide women's health services. And so when they found a place where a clinic responsibly said uh, this procedure needs transport because we need another level of care or an additional type of service that we're not prepared to provide, but we know can be provided in another level of care. When they responsibly d decided to do those, Bud and Tara Shaver took those 911 calls, spread them nationally. They didn't pitch them in New Mexico news. They pitched them on national blogs and in national right-wing news to sort of fire up the base and create this false crisis. And they've used that now to organize nationally. And so when they got ready to do this effort here in Albuquerque, as has been widely now reported, thanks to some great work by our folks going undercover and other groups that have been exposing this. We saw two busloads of California teenagers who came and were profiled in one of the local news stations where the kids said, I'm not sure why I'm here, but I'm trained to do something. Uh -huh. um, we saw national leaders uh, from Operation Rescue, uh, one a convicted terrorist who had set a bomb in an abortion clinic, came here to talk to those children about what the movement was here. So again, we are... Our democracy in Albuquerque, particularly in Albuquerque, is such that it's very citizen-based, and they bring they are now bringing those people in from out of state to learn how to knock on doors, how to make phone calls, how to have conversations one-on-one -on -one at the door, which is something the left has been much more effective at because of labor and other people who've had boots on the ground. And the right has traditionally relied on sort of air support, car roving, dirty ad campaigns. Yeah. They're looking for new tactics. And this is for them a way, again, I keep saying it, but it's right, I think, a petri dish for how do we copy some of the successful tactics that the progressives have put on the ground in a place like Albuquerque and use that in their own campaigns. we got to give them credit. It's incredibly smart. But it is, don't be fooled, it's the same people, the national groups in California from Kansas and others. Uh, who are doing it. And in fact, even the group that's on the ground right now, as we as we sit here today, about 10 days out of the election, the the four or five now groups that are running, pushing this agenda campaign, uh, one of them, uh, Albuquerque voters for the late term abortion ban, uh, took, we filed an ethics complaint claiming that they didn't disclose all their donors. They didn't disclose the work they were doing months ahead of time to lead up to this. But now we find out that Operation Rescue registered uh, their domain name has provided technical assistance from their offices out of state to do that kind of work for them. So it is designed to look very grassroots. Um, and some of the local people are really doing a lot of the work. But the organization is coming from on high. And when things get hot and heavy, we're seeing those national people come here to take over again. And, and it's, a net, it's a message and it's a lesson for folks nationally to look out for because this is exactly what we've seen in state legislators, state legislature. And now we, we are concerned we're going to see it municipality to municipality. So there's a, a, a large counter movement, though, is there not? And it's also a national movement, and it's also, it's also a grassroots movement. I've been surprised to see ACLU and Act Blue and all kinds of other organizations. I guess everybody really is seeing that this is a, this is a kind of a domino situation. You go here, you lose, you win here, depending on who you are, uh, and you have a chance to go all, all over the country. Uh, it's a, it's a, a terrifying thing. Um, why did this ballot uh, leave out protections for rape and incest? Uh, well, your guess is as good as mine. 
Um, but I can sort of speculate and I'll sort of let me throw out what I do know and we can sort of figure that out together. Um, if we look back to, you know, the legislative session earlier this year, um, we sort of made Ka Representative Catherine Brown's life a little uncomfortable for a couple of weeks during the session when we, we drew attention to the bill that she and every Republican member of the ha House of Representatives, a female Republican member, signed on to um, that would have prosecuted victims of rape of inc and incest for attempting to terminate their pregnancy. Um, it was prosecute the rape victims bill. And we saw that as, from our perspective, we look at that and say, that was directly attacking a provision of Roe v. Wade um, that the Supreme Court has long since held and has the, the American population and the community and citizens have long said is a reasonable and required provision to protect certain provisions for women. Um, so the courts long said that that municipalities and states can, within reason, uh, regulate some parts of the medical procedures of this. And I'm not a lawyer, but we've always held rape and incest. But we saw that that was a direct attack at one of those exceptions. And had that succeeded, it would have directly eroded a key part of Roe v. Wade from their perspective. And I think that's what we're seeing here, too, um, is that the movement and the, the idea and sort of... Uh, the passion behind this on the right has become like all politics, I think, on the right to some degree, taken over by the extremists. So folks who who originally were just opposed to abortion and wanted to work through the traditional political process uh, to have a balanced debate have really been moved aside by the more extremist wings of this party. And now you have people like Operation Rescue who see no exception, no option. Um, and come from a very conservative religion, religious perspective, I've now taken over the conversation in many respects here. Um, and it, that's what's really scary. Um, that for We saw they copied this in one interview. We saw they copied this from the Texas abortion bill that was so infamous and is still being litigated there. Um, but this goes sort of Texas plus. It takes away some of those exceptions. Um, it overregulates. It really draws a bright line and a, really a, an arbitrary place in the sand. Um, but if if you look at it from their perspective, I think it's very deliberate attack on some very uh, specific provisions of abortion law that they have long objected to and have not yet been able to challenge. Um, they're not waiting anymore. They're just going to go after it. So I kind of thought that this was this really was always a kind of a do or die situation. Mm -hmm. This is a place we really have to win here. I um, I'm surprised to uh, to think that that there isn't. Uh, worry on on uh, the pro side of this uh, that there will be uh, considerable constitutional challenge and uh, I'm also concerned that that um, that the level of, of of passion has been so intense and so uh, it's really almost violent. I wrote a column a long time ago about about the relationship between uh, between terrorist tactics and anti-abortion uh, sentiment, and um, and I, I'm very worried about this here. I, uh, I know we haven't seen it yet because it's an election season, but I worry that if uh, that if they lose, there will be some residual people here who might try something scary. And I, I don't mean to sound alarmist, but I guess I am alarmed. Uh, so what are what would the constitutional challenges be, and could we sustain them to victory? As you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't play one on TV. Um, but I've heard a lot of this from a lot of really smart lawyers. So let me take a crack at this just a little bit. Um, you're right that the opposition has sort of nationally recognized the threat here. Um, and whether we, we the attorney general has challenged that, that he believes this is unconstitutional, the city attorney has said this is unconstitutional, and even you saw the city council at one point trying to pass a resolution to hold off on placing this on the ballot, uh, because by one estimate, it's going to cost upward of a million dollars of taxpayer money that, quite frankly, here in Albuquerque, we could use to, you know, create jobs, uh, you know, reinvest and revitalize in some neighborhoods and communities, uh, put back into law enforcement raises that we promised our police officers we haven't given them yet. Um, and they're taking that out of our pocketbook and putting this in this program. Um, and I think in one way, there are a lot of folks who are willing to ha or wanting to have this legal challenge because they want sort of nationally to take that to the Supreme Court. But we also recognize, again, we've talked about there's no rape or incest exception in this law. And the Supreme Court has long held that that is a key provision of any sort of challenge or restriction that might be considered by any, reg any government uh, when they're looking at privacy issues. But the attorney general has also uh, suggested in layman's terms is that New Mexico's laws governing privacy and women's rights are far more liberal 
than even the federal extensions. And so if it's not even constitutional on a federal level, it certainly wouldn't be here in New Mexico. And so the court, even the federal district courts who have looked at Texas's law and other laws that were similar, like Colorado and others, where they've tried these regulations, have all said on a number of provisions, these things go too far. Um, Roe v. Wade is very particular in the case law that follows it. And this is right along path. It, it's cut and paste from some of those. And so the, the, the legal challenge and sort of the legal challenge to this is clear. And we even saw Archbishop Sheehan at the at his uh, at his sermon or his, his mass uh, last Sunday, uh, commanding sort of Catholics to go vote for this, acknowledge that it's unconstitutional and it likely will be turned back, but they have a duty to, to do it, um, to give it a good sort of a good college try. And quite frankly, I think a lot there are a lot of people who are opposed to this for a lot of good reasons. And the wasting the taxpayers' resources is, is certainly one of the first that we hear about on the phones and are talking to voters every day. Um, res- but, you know, re- above respecting women and not putting government in the middle of our personal decisions, but also just the way this has been come about, that everyone realizes from the very beginning that this is abuse of our, an abuse of our process by people that don't even belong here and don't have any stake in what they leave behind. And that's what's offensive to a lot of us. So I've been covering municipal politics uh, since 1971. I've never seen anything even remotely like this. <laughs> this is a um, this is this is almost like a it's almost like a bolt out of the blue. We've been blindsided here. I don't think we really. I think most people in this town don't really you know haven't sort of woken up to this yet. But I think they're beginning to now. Also, kind of surprised at how, uh, as you mentioned a while back, how seemingly sort of. Um, oddly disorganized this this effort is on this ballot thing, where it seems to be almost um, as as disorganized as as efforts to stop uh, 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 same sex marriage, mm-hmm. and I'm 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 a little confused by this, uh, and I um, and I'd love your your insights into this. Well, uh, you you and I talked about this a little beforehand, and I think you're you're right in a sense that we've been a little shocked. We looked at, uh, as you know, at Progress Now, we've been a very much a part of New Mexico's effort to, to achieve marriage equality and advance that effort. And I think a lot of folks were very surprised. You know, we came out early in cooperation with Lynn Ellens to set up a legal defense fund, knowing that the, the opposition would do so, Senator Scherer and some of his Republican extremist right-wing caucus, so that we've nicely named the bigot caucus over there, really promised right away that they were going to stop this in the courts. But it took them nearly two and a half weeks to get a coalition of legislators together, an attorney willing to take this case, and a few dollars to file the paperwork. And that was really surprising. And and reporters were going to, to Las Cruces and saying, we're here, here's the lines of people trying to get their, their marriage licenses, and there's no opposition, there are no protests. We did this huge marriage a uh, gay marriage celebration on Albuquerque Civic Plaza with justices to marry married couples there at noon on the first day they were available here in Albuquerque, and two protesters showed up, and they left before the thing started. And it's not that we saw the same thing happen during the hearings. It's not that there's not opposition on the other side, and it's not that it's not well-founded, and that there are respectful people willing to have a respectful conversation about it. I have them every day. Mm-hmm. But the level of passion on those on that issue and this one sort of following here in New Mexico has been a, very limited to sort of a small caucus of true believers. Yeah. And sort of the Western libertarian live and let live thing is really alive here. We saw that around guns from our side. The other side was very much inflamed and impassioned around that. And even though 90 plus percent of New Mexicans and around the country believe that we should have some additional background checks towards, say, closing the gun show loophole, the level of passion, the number said 90, but the level of passion, the level of people willing to turn out and make that happen was lower on our side than on theirs. And the same as we think is really happening here with this amendment. People here in New Mexico have had the opportunity to engage in this conversation every legislative session since I can remember. And they've had the debate, they've had the hearings, and it's never been able to move forward because we trust our women. We trust our we trust our women to make their fa- health care decisions. We trust our families and young men and young women and families to decide how to deal with guns. We trust each other, even within hardly religious families, 
Um, we stand with our families before we let someone else attack them. And so time and time and time again, we see families rallying around a gay or lesbian son or daughter who's bullied in school, even if it goes against their church or their other beliefs, because we stand with each other. Um, and that's really what we've seen. And it's not until these outside groups start to play. And we, do, we have it on both sides. We have groups and gun rights groups that spend a lot of money here trying to advance an agenda. And now we have a lot of folks on the, the right wing uh, trying to attack women's rights in New Mexico. And again, I think it's because, you know, we have a very open grassroots democratic system that invites that. And it, but it's supposed to be for New Mexicans to participate, yes. Yes. not for other people to come in, manipulate, spend our money, and yes. waste a lot of time and refocus our energy. Um, now, don't get me wrong. We're perfectly happy to have this fight. We're perfectly happy to walk away from this and defend our values and be stronger and ability to do that later. It's what's going to happen with marriage. It's what I believe is going to happen here with this abortion initiative. And for what it's worth, if it brings new effort and it engages more people in the conversation and makes them more passionate and willing to stand behind our values and our beliefs, I'm all for it. I'm willing to have that fight. And I think a lot of people are. Um, but it's it's a stretch to say that it's time that, you know, we're equally balanced and that we need these outside people to tell us what we want. Yeah, actually, I think the thing that that sort of has everybody's goat is that we're, not only are we blindsided, but we're also angry about this. Mm-hmm. And I know I'm angry about it. I, I, uh, I was, I was uh, terribly distraught about it about the, uh, uh, the effort by outside groups to come in and tell us about marriage equality. Uh, it was just, it was insulting, it was disgusting, and it mm-hmm. infuriated me. And I think this, I think this has the same, the same effect. When I read this ballot, mm-hmm. and I see this, this name, which, I, which is so, so convoluted, I can't even remember, but the, but the uh, child pain. The pain capable something, yeah, yeah. ordinance, yeah. Uh, it just raised my hackles, uh, and and also I thought, oh, what a, a terrible losing strategy to make a ballot that's uh, almost three pages long, uh, in small type uh, that everybody has to try and read in order to figure out whether yes means yes or no means yes or you know, yeah. so <laughs> here I am, ranting away, away. But I but I do think this is a good place to have a fight and uh, and. and and we have to win this thing. Could you talk a little bit about that ballot? Mm-hmm. I'm surprised about this thing, and I want to hear your hear your views. So the bottom line is the the ballot initiative process in Albuquerque. We have to talk just really quickly about that because what it means is anybody can write any under the process we have that exists in Albuquerque. Anybody can write anything they want on the back of a napkin, file it with a city clerk, get five city voters to agree with them and they can start collecting petitions. If they get about 12,000 signatures or so over the course of several months, and let me tell you, that's not many Sunday afternoons standing in front of a West Side Walmart, then they can ha- force us to have that, that election. Um, and so the, what the city council was arguing for earlier was the language is clear. It says the city council shall place it on the ballot if they've qualified and done all the things they have to do. It could... Uh, we can get anything from requiring everybody in Albuquerque to wear green shoes on Sunday, and we would have to have a vote on that if we can get enough things. There are other cities who have a process that it are, requires a little legal sort of review up front. City of Santa Fe, for instance, requires that if you have all those things happen and citizens present it, the city attorney gets to weigh in, and it provides a way for the city council to sort of decide and have a conversation and a debate over whether this is appropriate and ask for some legal guidance. Albuquerque doesn't have it. And so it's important for us to understand that just because it's on the ballot doesn't mean it's a good law. And what people are showing up at the ballot and seeing, and we don't want them to be discouraged by, is that they show up with this really weird title, pain capable something or something ordinance. And it's not clear if you're banning it or if you're for it, as you mentioned, it's not clear that it's about abortion at all. Um, And then there are a number of little statements up the very front that are essentially arguments, uh, they're rhetoric that have no legal bearing essentially, but people are concerned Um, that they might be incorporated, that they're agreeing with those statements. And so we do that, and there are about 17 subsections. And if you, I'm not a lawyer, and then in type size 8 font in Spanish and English, it's really confusing. And it's understandable. I think that's really one of the objections here. We heard people time and time again arguing, the other side arguing for so long that Obamacare was so long and they didn't have time to read it, 1,300 pages. Well, the Albuquerque abortion ballot seems like that to a lot of people when they show up. 
What we want people to understand is what this means. It means that you're telling women that they're not smart enough to make a decision with their doctor and their families, and if their faith, if they so choose, which is exactly what they can do right now, and if you want to stand with our women and respect Albuquerque women, we have to vote against this. We have to vote against these people coming into our city. We have to vote against these people trying to manipulate our children with Halloween candy with, with abortion stickers on it. And we have to send a message that's strong enough that says, this is not a place we're going to let that happen. And we have to do it not by a 51-49 margin. We have to do it by a margin long and large enough that tells people not to come back to Albuquerque and try this again and that this they shouldn't try to take this to the next city. And that's why, to your point, you see so many people from around the country paying so much attention because there are a lot of places who are saying our laws are a lot like that. What if we're next? So, you know, I've, I've always been a... Um fascinated by local politics and I've always thought that's really where it always is you know all environment is local all politics are local yeah. uh, and so now we see uh, that indeed Santa Fe's uh, uh, local politics is becoming it's always been interesting but now it's becoming even more interesting and and I know you guys are up there uh, uh, working and, and observing and I'd like to get your your take on this uh, uh, particularly in terms of ballot initiatives up there and and if they have any relationship to ours down here? and uh, Well, yeah. So, you know, at Progress Now, we have about 100,000 members across the state who participate with us in all kinds of issues. So every county, every nearly every municipality we can find, we have people. But, but I think the reason the local people, our members in particular, progressives are getting more engaged locally is sort of if you have $100 in your pocket and you want to spend it on something political, you're sure not going to put it in anything in Washington right now. And quite frankly, you're not going to put a whole lot of it into what happens in Santa Fe in January because we don't seem to be getting a lot done there either, quite frankly. So people are engaging on the local level because it has the most to do with them. The process is usually simpler. They know the people involved because we know our counselors a little better than we know our state representatives and certainly better than most people know their Congress people. Uh, and so, but how cities do that is really, to me, the fascinating piece. So we talk about how easy it is for a bunch of people in in Albuquerque to sort of force something on everybody else. Santa Fe, for instance, has a little different process. Not only do they have a legal review in that citizen process, but they have a charter review commission. And so their charter says every so often, every few years, the city government, the city council and the mayor will appoint a citizen commission to look at our council. I mean, to look at our charter, to look at the rules that govern our government and decide, is there anything that needs to be updated? Is there anything that needs to be changed? And so there's sort of a regular process for that. And so occasionally you'll hear one of our, our members there will alert us to something and say, I was at the city council last night and some city councilor asked this question about whether we need a new department to do this. And so they... They decided to send that in a couple of years to the Char Citizen Charter Review Commission. And so it really gives citizens a chance every so often to do this so that these issues don't back up and, and or you know become sort of the fire in the pan and let's deal with the crisis now with a big overreaction. There's a deliberate process for it. Um, so that's sort of the long way to say. So here we come. In 2014, Mayor Koss has decided he's not going to run. So there's a slew of candidates looking to follow his, most of them looking to follow his progressive agenda that he's laid out. Um, and a number of those people are also uh, from the city council. So that, that shakes up the city council a little bit. And the Citizen Charter Commission has now re made their recommendations that the council has acted on. So they've got four or five issues that are going to be on the ballot. Most of them are pretty simple. Statements in Santa Fe, statements like protecting our water is important to us. Um, things like we stand with our labor, and they're going to write that into the city charter. Things that are progressive in values that enshrine that this is prog we're the progressive capital of New Mexico, and this is what we believe. But they're also looking at something uh, called a strong mayor uh, issue, which basically means right now, believe it or not, uh, in the city of Santa Fe has about 1,400 employees, $90 million budget, and they have a part-time mayor to run all that. If it was a business, uh, they would the, the board of directors would have long since launched that structure and replaced it with somebody in charge. Um, but it's only because of really strong personalities that we've been, they've been able to manage that. Uh, and they do all that through a series of bureaucrats who report to the council and the mayor. And that sort of creates one person with a whole lot of bosses and a whole lot of people to be responsible for. So one thing the city council, the Charter Review Commission has recommended is that citizens get to vote by ballot initiative on creating a full-time mayor 
that's more responsible for managing the day-to-day operations, sort of a CEO and a COO all in one. Um, the charter, the com- the council is having the debate right now about what those different, uh, what that structure should look like. There's like seven of them that they're considering. But if that process was happening here in Albuquerque, we very likely would have four or five different ballot questions from different constituency groups that all could qualify and would have to be voted on. It would be really confusing to voters. So I think there's something that needs to come out of this here in Albuquerque after all this that we need to take a look at our ballot process and say there is, should be a way for citizens to, to hold their government accountable and to participate in that process. But is it too easy? And is a place like Santa Fe the right answer for how we look at that? Or is there a hybrid to do it? Um, because you see a place like Roswell even right now. Last Earlier this year, the Roswell City Council considered a resolution um, that was essentially considered by all in plain English to essentially be unwelcoming to gays and LGBT families. And that's a big issue for their tourism industry, and it's a really big issue for the gay families that live there. Mm-hmm. More than 200 families organized online through our system and with our EQ&M and others to say, no, that's not true. Um, and they threatened to look to ask the city council for a resolution uh, that sort of said uh, that that secured recognition of, of gay and lesbian couples uh, in the city charter there. So there are different processes all along the way, some citizen initiated, some otherwise. But people are getting more and more engaged in that local process because it's about the only place you can get anything done right now. Um, and as Santa Fe shows, you can get a lot done. You can start marriage equality from the from the mayor's office and from the city council. You can really have the gun debate. Uh, that they wanted to have, that the legislature, quite frankly, wasn't willing to have. And we can stand with the minimum wage, and we can decide they passed the highest living wage, and they're standing behind it. And they fixed the Santa Fe River. They put water back in a river, and that's a pretty big accomplishment anywhere in New Mexico. It's sure a big accomplishment for a handful of people in a city council and a mayor. So if you got money to put it in, people are putting it in local right now. So... uh we know here in Albuquerque that uh, this last election was fairly disappointing in terms of uh, traditional politics. We didn't see anybody of the same political party supporting anyone else. We saw no move from the Democrats or from the Republicans, for that matter, to uh, to actually try to have um, their way with us, if you will. We saw a pretty, uh, pretty flaccid process where... Nobody wanted to challenge a guy who had incredibly high poll numbers, and uh, we don't really know if the polls created the vote or, mm-hmm. or, or or if they reflected it. But we do know that if you go down to, say, Las Cruces, and if you happen to be a bunch of progressives and you organize really hard, uh, you can actually take over the city council and the mayor's office. Uh, so there's a uh, there's a whole... this This question of taking politics back to the local level and really becoming involved in it. It's a, it's a powerful notion and a wonderful and inspiring one, I think, and an energizing one. Um, is it likely, do you think, to catch hold, or are we going to be numbed like we always have been by these national, every 10 minutes, you know, call for money, call for money, call for money? Uh, I would be more than happy to give my money to local politics. Well, the folks on the local level, whether they're city councilors or sometimes mayors, would really welcome your money. But thankfully, more than the rest of the country and more than the rest of the state, a lot of them are on public financing. Right. So the money that goes actually goes to the issues and not the candidates to hope they pull the, the right strings and get the right thing done. So I think that's one thing that's rewarding. And we ought to note that and we ought to be pushing for that. It was really challenged here in Albuquerque last time when we saw Republican backers of the mayor who went to court to sue to undo the public financing right. rules so that uh, people who do business with the city can give publicly give donations to the mayor that was sort of against the rules and they wanted to change that. I don't know why. Um, but I, no, I, I do think you're right. You look at Las Cruces and it's been a very, it's not, it's, there's no manipulation behind it, but it's been a very determined group of people for a number of years who sat down and said, hang on, we've got progressive values here. We've got progressive people. How do we get those in the right place? Um, so that we build up sort of the bench of people to take leadership, to take ownership, to build their own coalitions, and then how do we get them elected into places that, that matter? Not everybody needs to be president, and not everybody, but everybody can do something local, whether the neighborhood association who turns into the city councilor, and we see that here in Albuquerque in exactly the reverse, because 
from our perspective, and we take a lot of responsibility for looking at this and saying we sort of took our eye off the ball in Albuquerque for a lot of ways. We have we elected a Republican mayor sort of in that Tea Party surge back in, in 2009 and 2010 when we got Re- Governor Martinez. And people sort of didn't pay enough attention to what was happening in the city council, meaning we didn't back up our good progressives when they were in charge and they had a good idea. There wasn't organizing to say, yes, everybody's quick to cast a stone, but nobody wants to go stand behind somebody in line. And so we sort of let that go and went to the sexy, let's go challenge it problem. Well, now we're seeing the sort of the fruits of that labor. They were controlled the city council during redistricting, which helped the Republicans pick up a couple of seats. And when Councilor uh, O'Malley went to the county commission and we replaced, uh, they replaced her with a sort of a, a very extremist Roxana Meyer, sort of business, pro-business Republican uh, with some now ethical concerns and issues of her own in the short time she's been there, we should have all seen that coming and said, this council is aligning with the mayor and it's not with our values. And instead, um, the Albuquerque Journal went greatly unchallenged and it got to be a great mouthpiece for their message. A number of TV stations in the same bucket uh, while we were all off messing around with Congress and having the Republican partisan Tea Party progressive fight there. So I, to your point, I think, Places like Las Cruces that didn't take their eye off the ball, the Progressive Voter Alliance there meets monthly and does great work. They never let up. You're seeing that happen here in Albuquerque now. You're seeing that happen in Santa Fe where they said, maybe we got a little distracted with other things. Progressives are coming back together again and saying, what are our values? What happens when David Koss is not our mayor? And Are we sure that the next mayor is going to be there for us? Or what do we do to support the right candidates to keep our issues ahead? All those things are incredibly important. So there's a big lesson to come out of Las Cruces. As we sit here, uh, you know, two of our most progressive counselors down there, uh, Gil Sorg and Olga Pedroza, were reelected easily last night. But a third, who was in a three-way race with a very Tea Party, very openly Tea Party-backed uh, candidate, uh, is down by 12 points and ah. may likely go to recount. But um, still, it, it's unlikely that we'll have that extra seat. And so we lost a good progressive to a Tea Party challenger, um, and I, I venture to say that there was more work that could have been done across the state to support those candidates, um, because what they do in Las Cruces matters when places like Santa Fe want to do something progressive or when Lynn Ellens wants to issue a marriage license. Um, lo- he's looking for people to support him, and you got to be able to demonstrate that. You know, I think that's, I think that's a wonderful analysis. Uh, we, um, I think the disenchantment uh, with national politics and even state politics, really does uh, sort of lead to a wonderful uh, insight of George uh, Santiano who said, wisdom comes from disillusionment. And uh, the wisdom, I think, uh, to be gained here is that there is a legitimate, powerful reason to, to, to not play at politics, but be in politics, in your locality, in your life, uh, because you can help your friends, not in a nep- nepotistic way, but in a communitarian way, uh, and you can help your world. I've had a wonderful time with you today, and thank you so very much for being here with us. And I hope you'll come back and talk about other things in the future. Thanks. No, this has been fabulous. Y'all, the, y'all at New Mexico Mercury are giving a voice to people who really need it in New Mexico and some incredibly smart people with some really big ideas that need to spread it. So thanks for what y'all are doing. Um, it is important. And so I'll make this last pitch and say, we're as we sit here just a few days out of the Albuquerque election, Every single vote against that ballot initiative is going to count um, in for those that are in District 7. And believe me, you know who you are because you're getting mail and phone and everything <laughs> else every day. Uh, need to vote for the progressive candidate. We need to turn Janice Arnold, the council, back to, to the progressives that belong and, and turn Janice Arnold Jones out there. So we need people to do that. If they don't live in Albuquerque, you want to pick up the phone and call somebody in Albuquerque who does because their vote is, is New Mexico's vote. Um, the attacks on these women, this is the only place in the country, in the state where women can obtain these services anymore. Uh, they used to be able to go in a number of other places, and they've all come down here to Albuquerque now uh, for a number of reasons. So the vote for the woman in Grant County um, to call her friend here in Albuquerque is the vote for her friend, and we need those folks to, to make those calls uh, because we're counting on every single one of them. Uh, and that's how we build this power back. We need to send a strong message again that we're going to take this city back, we're going to take this movement back, and we know where New Mexico stands, and we're going to be here to give them some power to do it. Thank you. Thanks.